Tonight, Ottawa suspends random COVID testing at airports. This was an extra 20 minutes in a queue that I could have done without. Will it reduce those long waits? Also tonight, with lots of jobs to fill, employers are upping their offers to workers. You have to look at compensation, benefits packages, the whole gamut. And a closer look at what Americans were shown about the January 6th attack. Will it make a difference in a divided country? This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. If you've been at a Canadian airport recently, perhaps you've been stuck in one of those long lines. Today, the federal government announced a step it says will help. Starting Saturday and for the rest of the month, random COVID testing will be suspended. But does that actually address all the reasons for all those delays? Renee Filipponi takes a look. For passengers arriving on international flights today, the suspension of random testing is welcome news. I've just had one and it was an extra 20 minutes in a queue that I could have done without. Until the end of June, random testing will be suspended for arriving vaccinated passengers. After that, it will be done off-site. The airports are designed to be mini uh, healthcare centers, and so this will help with staff, it'll help with uh, congestion, and particularly in those times when we have lots of flights coming in. The delays at Canadian airports have been extensive. People waiting for hours in security and customs, even missing flights. In a statement, the Greater Toronto Airport Authority says this is welcome news for the upcoming summer travel season, as it is expected to reduce processing time, but that there are many factors that cause congestion, including staffing. I think the holdup is the inexperienced staff. As much um, as they are trying their best and their hardest, it's a lot of new staff. There was a high turnover uh, rate in every area in the airport. Other industry experts say there are still other COVID policies that are part of the problem. This should be a first step. I'm not sure it's really going to solve the big problem, which is really the, uh, the Arrive Can app and the CBSA uh, times required to make sure everybody's adhering to the regulations in the Arrive Can app. But for now, it's no vacation for travelers arriving or leaving Canadian airports. Instead, it's an experience testing their patience to the limits. It was, I counted probably six customs workers working for a line of like 300 people, I would estimate, 200 people. So it was, it was really bad. And with chronic staffing issues dragging on, delays and congestion at airports could last through the summer. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. An even bigger change in the states, the U.S. is dropping its COVID test requirement for international air travelers effective this Sunday at 12.01 a.m. Airlines and travel industry had argued the measure was no longer needed. The White House now says new data backs that up. The CDC will reassess in 90 days and could bring testing back if it feels that's necessary. Canadians aren't just fed up with airport delays. For many, the stress is at passport offices. The backlog there has many worried they won't be able to leave the country. Stephen D'Souza looks at the unusual steps that some are taking. Before many Canadians can take off, first they have to pack for the sidewalk. The winter coat, chairs, we have some snacks in the bag. <laughs> Ahmed Zakri arrived at 3.30 this morning, five hours before this Toronto passport office opened. In late July, he's hoping to visit family in Egypt after six long years. I'm freaking out a bit. I'm trying to keep it under control, but yeah. You need a trip booked to line up without an appointment. How are you traveling the next 45 business days? Mail-in applications take more than nine weeks to process. The promise here is two weeks. Vicki Loberg, though, applied in person in March. It's ridiculous. I go by the rules and, and I'm stuck. In two weeks, she wants to be with her pregnant daughter in Ireland. I didn't get to see her get married. I didn't get to see the first child. And now this is the second and I really need to get there. The government says passport demand is unprecedented. Back in 2020, demand was low. The following year, it tripled and could triple again this year. Is nine weeks plus an acceptable timeline for this most basic of government services? This is something that's happening around the world, but we're putting additional resources in place to deal with it here in Canada. Approved for travel? 
Surface Canada workers say they warned the government this was coming. We've had physical violence. We've had computer monitors thrown at our, at our members. And they warn hiring new staff isn't a quick fix. Even just hiring people now isn't going to make much of an impact for the next several months. Meanwhile, for an extra $20, Ahmed Zakri was told he'll have his passport in two weeks. Getting here so early paid off because, like, in the end, it was just five minutes and we were done. At least he hopes he's done and won't have to return to the sidewalk. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. The latest job numbers might make you think Canada's workers have never had it better, at first glance at least. A net gain of nearly 40,000 new jobs in May, most of those full-time. The unemployment rate sank to 5.1%, yet another new low since records started being kept in 1976. Canada has regained all 3 million jobs lost in the pandemic, plus a half million more. But when the economy runs this fast, it brings problems that could wipe out any gains that workers make. We'll get to that. But Nisha Patel begins with the challenge for employers. You can take a third place, just like this. The Canadian brew house in Victoria is buzzing, training up many new workers here and hundreds more at locations across the country. We've probably increased our staffing by about 25% or about 800 staff. Restaurants and hotels are adding workers as fast as they can trying to meet demand as more Canadians eat out and travel. For businesses trying to hire, it's stiff competition. It does challenge us to find more creative ways to recruit and you have to look at compensation, benefits packages, the whole gamut to try and uh, entice people to understand your brand. That's pushing up paychecks. Average hourly wages were up almost 4% in May, compared to a year earlier. Ellen Chen recently scored herself a higher salary. The lawyer jumped from a major law firm to a tech company. They did offer me some more interesting conditions, both in terms of pay, remote work, and in terms of flexibility in hours. Oh, yeah. Chen says she's heard from many recruiters over the past few months, and she's not alone. Lots of my friends are also changing jobs. I looked at LinkedIn almost every day, somebody's switching jobs. In a tight job market, employees have more leverage, but higher wages come with a cost. Employers now have to pay a lot more for workers, and that means the cost of production of everything goes up, and they have to increase prices then to compensate for that. So while higher wages are good news for workers, they can add to already soaring inflation, giving policymakers more reason to keep raising interest rates in the months ahead. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Our business correspondent, Peter Armstrong, is watching this closely. And Peter, inflation is casting such a shadow over these job numbers. It is, Ian. And it's really because inflation just, it eats into everything. You know, you look at these numbers. Wages are up, what, 3.9%? Great. Until you consider inflation was probably 7% or so in May. So actually, these wages are negative 3.1%. Workers are losing ground. But... You know, inflation is much more than just the numbers. It's an insidious thing. If you think inflation is going to get worse and maybe cause a recession, you'll scale back on spending to save. But in doing so, you may inadvertently amplify a downturn. So that's why we're watching everything through the lens of inflation right now. And so much of what drives inflation is global, high oil prices, uh, shipping, food costs. So what about interest rate hikes? Can they do the trick? They can, but you're right. A big, big part of this is global. But a big chunk of it, remember, is domestic too. Today's numbers in the U.S., for example, show core inflation, so stripping out gas and food. That's up by 6%. Shelter costs are surging. Airfares are way up. Cars close as well. So the central banks in the U.S., but here in Canada as well, can't throw up their arms and say, ah, it's all global. There's nothing we can do. The question, though, is can they strike a balance? Can they raise interest rates to slow inflation, but not so much that they end up causing a recession? Okay, Peter, thank you. You bet. An estimated 20 million Americans watched last night's congressional hearing into the January 6th attack. They saw some shocking new video and heard new evidence of what some lawmakers say was a failed coup. But not all the major networks carried the hearing, and today many people are dismissing it. Susan Ormiston has the story. We have a breach of the Capitol. It's important the that the American Capitol. people understand what truly happened and to understand that the same forces that led January 6th remain at work today. 
President Biden trying to persuade Americans to sit up and pay attention to the historic and sprawling January 6th investigation, including evidence that Donald Trump endorsed the mob calling to hang Mike Pence. Maybe our supporters have the right idea. Mike Pence, quote, deserves it. In a post today, Trump denied, calling that a made-up story. All they're doing is trying to paint a new political narrative that voters need to think about in November. So last night's hearing was a primetime dud. The primetime hearing dismissed by supporters. Fox News slammed it as propaganda and a circus. Well, the dullest, the most boring, there's absolutely nothing, nothing new, multi-hour Democratic fundraiser masquerading as a January 6th hearing. We believe Donald Trump is responsible. He lit the flame. He, he summoned the mob. The January 6th committee wants to paint Trump as the central figure in inciting the terror and threats on Capitol Hill. There are a lot of American people that believe in Donald Trump, believe uh, he's telling them the truth. They're being abused and they're being lied, lied to. More evidence will be laid out next week with the Department of Justice watching as part of its criminal investigation. But Friday, as Americans woke up to inflation rates not seen in 40 years and record gas prices, will the January 6th hearings turn heads? Three more next week. On Monday, we expect to hear how Donald Trump knew he had lost the election, but still whipped up a massive effort to spread fraudulent information, according to the committee. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. And we'll dig into the video from last night's hearing with someone who has deep knowledge of what unfolded on January the 6th. Revelations from Congress on the attack through the eyes of a reporter who was there when it happened. That's coming up later in the program. In California, the Summit of the Americas wrapped up tonight with a joint agreement on migration. Canada pledged $27 million this year as part of the deal to address the migrant crisis. We'll also increase refugee resettlement from the Americas and welcome 4,000 additional individuals by 2028. The summit ended after five days of meetings marked by the absence of some heads of state who either weren't invited or boycotted the event. The Pope has postponed a visit to Africa planned for early July, his second delayed trip in recent weeks. And in Canada, that news is hitting hard because it could cast doubt on Pope Francis's promise to visit here in late July. Olivia Stefanovic shows us the expectations that hang in the balance. On the shores of this historic pilgrimage site, prayers are offered every week for Pope Francis asking our creator, our God, you know, to, uh, to, to bring you here simply and, and to have this meeting with indigenous people. The 85-year-old pontiff is experiencing persistent knee pain, seen using a wheelchair as recently as Friday. Now some wonder if his postponed trips mean his Canada visit is in peril. If there is any chance that the Pope will not come in, then I think there's going to be a lot of disappointment. We've received no indication that he's considering postponing the trip to Canada. The Archbishop of Regina says it's full steam ahead, the trip being planned to accommodate the Pope's mobility needs. In the past, papal visits have drawn hundreds of thousands of people. But this trip may be substantially smaller, with the Pope only spending an hour tops at each event. I'm confident that if it's at all possible for him to come, he will come. It's possible that having canceled the trip to Africa uh, will boost his chances to, trip to, to travel to Canada at the end of July. This is a very important trip. Um, it is more critical, I think, for Pope Francis' legacy. And to fulfill his commitment to meet residential school survivors on their land this summer. I think that uh, this, this has to be it, this, uh, this visit. I think this visit is going to happen. I'm uh, very optimistic. That's the hope of many survivors and many millions of Roman Catholics counting down the days to the historic visit. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa.
New details tonight from a CBC News investigation into an alleged double murder in Edmonton. It raises questions about the actions of the RCMP, the province's justice system, and the Edmonton police. And it's left members of that city's Chinatown area not just grieving, but angry. Paige Parsons explains. The beating deaths on May 18th devastated people in Edmonton's Chinatown. The two victims, 64-year-old Hung Trang and 61-year-old Ben Huang. Justin Bone was charged with second-degree murder. Bone was out on bail at the time, living with a family friend 70 kilometers west of Edmonton. But the friend says he began to feel unsafe. His identity is being protected out of concerns for his safety. There are three different entities in the justice system, and all three of them failed not only me, but just in himself. On May 15th, the friend contacted RCMP, alleging Bone threatened him. In a statement, the RCMP confirms officers took Bone to Edmonton. Despite a bail condition that he not be there, he was dropped off near a social services hub in the west end of Edmonton. The friend warned RCMP it wasn't safe for Bone to be unsupervised and called Edmonton police to warn them too. A city police spokesperson says they did make contact with Bone. Given no criminal offense was observed, officers could not lawfully detain him. Bone's probation officer was also contacted. The Alberta Justice Ministry did not answer questions from CBC News about the probation officer's actions. It's a blow to the families of Bone's alleged victims. For RCMP just to drop him off in Edmonton where he wasn't supposed to be, it's a complete distress in the justice system. We all should be mad. These are our brothers and sisters that live in the same city that we call Edmonton. The RCMP has launched an internal review. Edmonton's mayor says the province and the city police should too. We hear from the community all the time that people are being dropped off close to services without any plan at all. Right? So this is systemic. This community says it will demand change to make things safer. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. The Battle of Severodonetsk in Ukraine's east continues, even as Ukrainian forces say they're outgunned in some cases 7 to 1. Margaret Evans is close to the front lines where Ukrainian resistance is under intense pressure. This is what Vladimir Putin's war has brought to the Donbass. Ghost towns, bruised and battered, and frail caretakers left behind, those who can't or won't leave. Svetlana Obosna is 82. I'm not afraid, she says, because this is a war and you have to be strong. Sloviansk is about 60 kilometers from Severodonetsk, scene of some of the fiercest fighting of the war. The battle for the city is considered pivotal, given Russia's perceived intention of taking all of the industrial heartland. These pictures are from a state-owned Russian news agency. Frightened people still in the city live underground. This woman, since April 6th. A bomb hit her house, she says. It fell through the roof and the ceiling in the hall. It's still lying there. People in Sloviansk fear if the Russians take Severodonetsk, they could be next. The building behind me was damaged in a rocket attack just about a week ago, and you wouldn't think it to look at it, but there are still people living inside. No water, no electricity, and we are right in the center of Sloviansk. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has called fighting in the Donbass extremely difficult, but he insists Ukrainian troops are holding. Other cities of the Donbass, which the occupiers now consider to be the primary targets, stand, he says. But at a terrible cost. Ukrainian authorities say they're losing as many as 100 soldiers a day. Repeating appeals for more and better weaponry, given the strength of the enemy they're facing. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Sloviansk. Cigarettes will soon come with a few new warnings on the inside of the pack. Poison in every puff. Next, will putting a message on every single cigarette help Canadians quit? 
Plus, from cod to cannabis, how an old Newfoundland fish plant is bringing new hope to a small town. You can smell it through the mask. Yeah. The fish plant never smelled like this. And after cancelling his concerts, Justin Bieber opens up about his health. This is pretty serious, as you can see. We're back in two. CBC News, The National, named Canada's best national newscast at the Canadian Screen Awards. Pop star Justin Bieber is speaking publicly about the illness that has forced him to cancel performances in Toronto this week. As you can see, this eye is not blinking. I can't smile on this side of my face. This nostril will not move. In a video posted to Instagram, the singer says he has Ramsey Hunt syndrome. It's caused by a virus and has left one side of Bieber's face temporarily paralyzed. I wish this wasn't the case, but obviously my body's telling me I gotta slow down. Bieber had been set to perform at Toronto's Scotiabank Arena on Tuesday and Wednesday. He said the last minute postponement was due to worsening sickness. The move was met with mixed reaction from fans. Some wished him well, others expressed bitter disappointment. There's no reason to worry though, according to one expert. I would predict the, that he would be like the vast majority of people that do uh, make a very good recovery. In the meantime, Bieber says he'll be taking time off and hopes his fans will understand. I love you guys. Thanks for being patient with me. Canada is poised to launch a global first in cigarette labeling. We've all seen those health warnings on the outside of packs. Well, the new plan is to go a step closer to the harmful product. But as Lauren Pelly explains, there's concern the process is moving too slowly. More than two decades after Canada first introduced shocking warnings on cigarette packs, the federal government wants to add more, this time on every cigarette. One possible message. The poison in every puff. The government's goal is for less than 5% of the population to use tobacco by 2035. Adding health warnings on individual tobacco products will help ensure that these essential messages reach people, including the youth who often access cigarettes one at a time in social situations. Daily or occasional smoking rates were already dropping year by year between 2015 and 2019 among both male and female Canadians over the age of 12. But the average doesn't tell the whole story. There are communities in the north where nearly 50% of the population still are smoking. Regular smokers in Toronto told us warnings on each cigarette won't make a difference. Because the damage is done. I'm already addicted to cigarette smoking. I think it's going to make more of a difference to, like, to, to younger smokers. It doesn't have to work for everyone to be significant and to have an effect uh, in Canada. This researcher on tobacco control policies says the changes are a positive step. What concerns him is a proposed six to nine month period for implementation. I think that's too long. Cigarettes in stores, they're, they're sold after just a few months. Packs could also include a longer list of health impacts. 48,000 Canadians die unnecessarily each year. Smokers lose, on average, 10 years of life expectancy. Other countries are exploring even bolder approaches to curb smoking rates. New Zealand and the UK are both looking at raising the legal smoking age year by year with a goal of eventually outlawing cigarettes. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Some tough news tonight for those who love a particular hot sauce. The maker of Sriracha Hot Sauce says it's suspending production for the summer. It blames weather conditions for affecting the quality and supply of the chili peppers used to make it. Now to British Columbia, new problems for farmers still reeling from last November's devastating floods. One key growing area, the Fraser Valley, is on track for one of the wettest Junes on record. Lindsay Duncombe shows us the scene there. It's, it's a fight and you're always fighting and everyone's getting tired of the fight right now. Even inside his barn, Grant Bauman can't escape the sound of rain. Uh, atmospheric river is a term we associate with pretty bad stuff. Um, disaster right away is the first thing you think. This was Bauman's farm last November. I, I, 
I got water rushing out of the calf barn because it's coming in the back door so fast, it's pushing in the front. The family lost feed for the cows then. Now they can't plant any. We still cannot get in the ground, it's too wet. We can't even drive tractors on the land, we just sink. This sopping June has delayed crops throughout the Fraser Valley. These strawberries should be harvested by now. We don't even want to grow outside anymore. We're like, okay, if we're going to continue in this business and if we're actually going to be making ends meet, we need to have some more control over our weather. Man Farms gained control by moving much of its crop inside. This new one hectare greenhouse stacks strawberries vertically. Less weather, more plants. Guess how many minutes we water this? No. Only 10 minutes a day. Really? That's it. 10 minutes a day, maybe two or three times a day. I've been fortunate enough to go all over the world and see innovation in agriculture. The Fraser Valley is far behind. We need to implement innovation. Easier said than done. How can you adapt dairy farming? I'm not sure there's an easy answer for that. The fight, it seems, is all about endurance. And uh, you, just, you just keep going. It's just like uh, in November, we just keep going. From fall flooding to spring rain and whatever comes next. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, near Yarrow. Next, a closer look at the impact of the never before seen footage of the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Insight from a reporter who was there on January 6th. And later, a royal shipwreck found at the bottom of the sea. Why it was kept secret for more than a decade until now. Compliance, but this is now effectively a riot. 49 hours declaring it a riot. Some of the video of the assault on the U.S. Capitol building played during Thursday's congressional hearing had never been seen before. It shows the scale and violence of the attack on January the 6th, highlighting the role President Trump played and challenging those who have sought to minimize the event. Kadia Goba is a national politics reporter with BuzzFeed News. She was there that day at the Capitol building. Uh, Kadia, thanks for speaking with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I, I want to ask you what impact the video released at the hearing might have. And I want to start with the far right group, the Proud Boys. And we're going to look at an excerpt as some of their members storm the Capitol. You advise, there's probably about 300 uh, Proud Boys. They're marching eastbound in this uh, 400 block of um, kind of independence actually on the mall towards the United States Capitol. I am not allowed to say what's going to happen today because everyone's just gonna have to watch. Kadia, the documentary filmmaker, as you know, testified last night about following the group and, and hearing how they planned out the attack. So, so kind of looking at it from the perspective of today, what does all of this say about the role of the Proud Boys? Yeah, so the January 6th committee, this is very intentional. And they're trying to draw a line between people in the administration and right-wing extremist groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers. So what you see here is them trying to debunk any idea that this is just a bunch of hooligans that just showed up at the Capitol, but more so that this was a premeditated and planned event by extremist groups at the direction of former President Trump. In the footage, as we know, we saw a lot of Trump flags and chants. The president also, no surprise, was tweeting, and, and the rioters appeared to be listening. My kids didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. U.S. demands the truth. Bring out pigs. Bring out pigs. Bring out pigs. Bring out pigs. So we heard a rioter reading out that, that uh, tweet from Trump. And so 
looking at everything and given what you know, do you think if Trump had tweeted for people to stand down at that point, there would have been a different outcome? There is no question in my mind had pre former President Trump tweeted to stand down that his supporters would have listened. This is a, the prime, th there's an example right there where you see them literally reading his tweets while they're standing outside of the Capitol. Lawmakers have yelled, were yelling it inside the Capitol and uh, an onslaught of people, including people within the administration was directing his, uh, Mark Meadows, his chief of staff to tell people to stand down. Of course they would have listened. One of the most riveting moments last night for me watching all of this was the Capitol Police Officer Caroline Edwards testifying. She described the violent chaos at the Capitol before and after she was injured. She said she had policed many demonstrations, but, but nothing like January the 6th. We're gonna get too many fucking people here. Look at this fucking bandage point, man. We're fucked. We lost the line. We lost the line. All OPDs came back. All OPDs came back up to the upper deck. All OPDs came back up to the upper deck. Hey, stop. Listen, from Vancouver, sitting on my couch, all of this was difficult to watch. You were there on January 6th. What was your reaction seeing the video images last night? It's been really hard. Um, it's been hard for me. It's been hard for members of Congress. During last night's hearing, you heard people crying, or you saw members of Congress crying. I know I've been in this weird mix of, you know, trying to watch it as a reporter, but varying away a little bit because it is very jarring. That was a 10 minute piece. And, you, and then just to follow up, you heard testimony from the Capitol Police officer, really describe what was going on, saying she was slipping on blood and that um, she saw her colleagues vomiting and she had to deal with all of that. And this is before she was knocked unconscious. So yeah, seeing this brings back a lot. It's triggering. It brings back a lot of memories that, and it's been a year and a half. I, I personally had to hide behind a chair during the event. I didn't understand the magnitude or the amount of people that were outside the door, but I did fear for my life. We can't predict these things, but as a political reporter based in Washington, you certainly have an insight that most of us do not. In a polarized America, what kind of impact do you think these hearings will have? I think people are, you know, speculating whether or not it's going to change voters' minds. I think, for one, it needs, the, it, I mean, this was a, an assault on democracy. And I think Democrats are really interested or, in making that clear. And second of all, I think people are trying to, re, Democrats are trying to remind people why they voted for uh, uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden. I think, I, I can't, I'm not lost on the political, um, you know, uh, triumph that they're going for here. But I think it's twofold, trying to convince people why they voted for Joe Biden and also just understanding this, this was a, a big assault on our democracy with the hopes that the Department of Justice actually acts. Kadia, so nice to have your insights on the program. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. And the January 6th committee hearings continue next week. They resume Monday morning starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. Next, an old Newfoundland fish plant gets a new life growing cannabis. I wonder what Pop would think of this. David Cochran returns to the plant where his grandfather once worked. That's after the break. And later, the story behind this close encounter. It's our moment tonight. Welcome back. Along the south coast of Newfoundland, a decades-old fish plant has suddenly been given a new lease on life. The cod production, production of long ago replaced now by cannabis. David Cochran takes us to Buren, a town and a plant with a personal connection. 
I'm driving to the old fish plant in Buren where my grandfather worked his entire life. This plant closed for good about 10 years ago, but now it's turning over a new leaf, transitioning from cod to cannabis. I wonder what Pop would think of this. We gotta put this on. Yeah, we just have to protect ourselves from any uh, contaminants from the outdoors. This second chance comes thanks to Taylor Giovannini. She's the driving force behind Oceanic Relief, and she's brought a new plant to the old plant. You can smell it through the mask. Yeah. It's intense here, yeah, right? It's like beautiful. The, the smell, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 the fish plant never smelled like this. No, no. It's, it's a better smelling <laughs> fish plant. A harvest that doesn't come from the sea, but grows under a lamp. So the name seaweed. Seaweed. It's a playoff. It's just... You're in an old fish plant and yeah. you're making seaweed. Gio Vanini knew about the plant because she grew up just a 30-minute drive down the road. It was an aha moment for me. She's built all this with family money and private investors after being drawn to a new industry near her old town. I always knew I was going to move out here and raise my son until a certain age. Um, you know, I grew up in St. Lawrence, which is very rural, and I loved my childhood. And that was one thing that I wanted to ensure my child have is that freedom that Around the Bay will give you. What does it mean for Buren to have someone trying to breathe new life into the old fish plant? I remember calling the mayor at the time and I said, well, my, my goal is to at least get to half of, uh, you know, what it used to be. And I, I so remember his tone and his everything. He said, Taylor, if you supply one job, that will help us. My grandfather, Jess Brown, worked at this plant for 30 years until 1982. And back then, it employed hundreds of people. When it shut down a decade ago, it was down to 125. If Taylor Giovannini can make a go of it, she hopes to build the workforce back up to about 100. Joy Drake worked here for 25 years when it was a fish plant. Back then, she packed up fillets and fish sticks. Now, she's packing something completely different. It's wonderful. It's different, but it's great. You learn different things. Every, every day is something different to do, and it's not boring. It's like a family. Okay, so here we have phase two. Growing that family will depend on growing the business. This lower floor is being prepped for expansion. And this will uh, quadruple our production up to 4,000 kilos per year. But the plan doesn't end in the plant. A little more than 2,000 people live in Buren. People have left. Jobs are scarce. Gio Vanini is buying old houses to renovate into employee housing. They want to grow cannabis, and they're very, very passionate about it. So I want to make sure that there's no roadblocks whatsoever in the way for them getting back and forth to work. It started in the old union hall, which is now a hangout for employees like Michelle Dix, who moved home from Halifax after the death of her father and the end of a relationship, searching for her purpose. Nervous. It's OK, he's got to cut it all. I was working at Ultramar and the cannabis shop opened, and I felt like this, just this little ray of light of like, that's my people. Going there, I felt that connection to a community, you know? And, you know, that made me feel more at home. I, because when I first moved here, I didn't necessarily know if I was gonna stay. So 11 years in Halifax, mm -hmm. three years back in Newfoundland, one year here in Buren, Marystown, how long do you hope to be able to stay? Forever. Cannabis saved my life, and then Oceanic gave me a life. The hope is that it lasts, but cannabis is an industry with more ups and downs than the tide. If it works, it will mean new life in an old plant long left for dead. David Cochran, CBC News, Buren, Newfoundland and Labrador. Cochrane channeling his inner Red Sharon. What a nice story. From the coast of Newfoundland to the coast of England. I just knelt there, took the moment in, probably five minutes, and just, 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 just unbelievable. Just one I'll never forget. How two brothers found a sunken warship that once carried a king.
Thanks. Welcome back. They located it 15 years ago, but it's only now that they're going public with the find. A shipwreck from more than 300 years ago. And this one included quite the cargo, a future king of England. Kayla Hounslow has more on the wreck and the brothers who found it. They spent decades diving shipwrecks from the First and Second World Wars. Two brothers who then decided to search for something different. One picked up this book and discovered the Gloucester. Then he picked up the phone and called his brother. And I said, are you up for a new adventure? Um, and go looking for the Gloucester, sank in 1682, cannon everywhere potentially, and he was just in there like a flash. It took four years, but they eventually found the ship's watery grave 45 kilometers off the coast of Norfolk. I could see um, dark shadow on the seabed, so you, you know you're on some wreck. And I just knelt there, took the moment in, for probably five minutes mm -hmm. and just 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 unbelievable just one I'll never forget that was 15 years ago for security reasons it's been a secret until now if you're a super naval history geek like me maritime history geek like me this is the best news ever this historian has been in on the secret for more than a decade it wasn't until the ship's bell was discovered in 2012 that it was confirmed as the Gloucester a royal shipwreck carrying the Duke of York, who became King James II. He survived, but an estimated 200 others did not. It had royals on board, it had aristocrats on board, it had posh people on board, so we got lots of in very interesting objects. Navigational equipment, personal possessions, even unopened bottles of wine, one bearing the crest of ancestors of U.S. President George Washington. So we're trying to work out scientific ways of having a little, can we get a little tiny probe into in the cork without damaging that cork and suck a little bit of wine out. This is exciting scientific news. And this is just the beginning as researchers work to uncover even more history, a time capsule of life more than 300 years ago. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. We're going to shift gears to a discovery of a much different kind. And the bear was unfazed, continued towards me just like I didn't do anything. A nature photographer's very close run-in with a bear is next. A wildlife photographer in Saskatchewan got a much closer encounter than he might have hoped for. When Curtis met Wish and spotted a bear, he hopped out of the car to snap some photos, and what happened then is tonight's moment. Hey, bear. Hey, get out of here. I'm leaving. I spotted a bear in the meadow, so I pulled over and I grabbed my camera. When I stepped off the trail, it went off the trail as well and started following me. So that was at that point that I knew that I was in a different bear encounter that I had ever had before. Hey bear, hey. From that point, I actually just stood my ground, started waving my arms, trying to make myself look as big as possible. Hey bear and giving some loud hay bears. hay bears. And the bear was unfazed, continued towards me hey. just like I didn't do anything. Okay. So that's when I changed tactics and I had my bear spray ready to spray at the bear. Good bear. It was obviously an intense situation and you yep, need to bear. keep your wits about you and stay focused. I decided to let out a little spray and the spray worked as designed and it sent the bear running immediately and I was able to get back to my car safe and sound. You get a sense of it there, but watching the raw tape, there is a moment where you realize, and he clearly realized that that bear was in the process of getting closer and closer and closer. And so what he did, by the way, he's got training. He, he's a, I guess, a firefighter in, in uh, like, the wilderness uh, and he has some training with uh, dealing with bears and what he did is more or less textbook in terms of staying safe and of course the bear spray as he pointed out worked that is the national for june 10th join me sunday for cross-country checkup on cbc radio as well as cbc news network and later that night right here for the national good night